All right, so um, what we really want to do now is try to have a, an open discussion to really think about many of the general themes that we've heard today with the goal of getting to, uh, at the end of our discussion period, some very well-defined uh, outcomes. And actually, just to remind you, and we'll come back to these in a few minutes, some of the outcomes we'd imagined up front were things like a white paper to describe needs in the US that arose from today's discussion, commonalities and interests or opportunities across the agencies, initial use cases, and, and I think there are a couple we might want to discuss uh, this afternoon, uh, plans for communication collaboration across the agencies moving forward, um, and then uh, needs and goals for interaction, and this is related in some ways to our GM6, which is an international meeting that will be hosted uh, here in uh, October, November, right? September. September. Um, so does that sound like a reasonable plan to everybody? <clears throat> so the first thing that we heard, I think, quite consistently from a number of the speakers was the need for standards and IT infrastructure. And, and this included things like uh, consistent electronic health records data, um, how do we share data across sites. And um, I, I guess maybe what I'd like to do is just take each of these items and see if there are additional comments that should be added to this. So for example, in the area of standards, what process could we use and which agencies here might need to be involved in that standards discussion. So an obvious one who's actually not here today is the Office of the National Coordinator for I Health IT. Um, that's clearly an important agency. <clears throat> but I, I was also struck, um, th there seems some really great opportunities and we didn't hear much about the plans, and maybe it's just too early, but we heard about the creation of this uh, Defense Health Agency. So is part of the agenda there to come to a common IT platform, is, or, or is it just too, too early to know what's going to happen? Yes, sir. I mean, I, I believe that we have a, a common IT platform and that the Air Force pretty much has the stick um, on that. Um, the larger um, issue is trying to have interoperability between the DOD and VA in terms of the EHR. That's a much larger problem. And. Um, the, 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 the VA system reportedly is a, is a, you know, is a good, large uh, health IT system. Um, are, are, are the barriers there just that um, there are two different governmental agencies and there's, because it seems like it's a national transition from being in service to being uh, <coughs> veteran. That's, that's uh, I'm going to go with that's a political um, problem, which I don't deal with at my pay grade. Um, <laughs> they have, they share a common ancestor, um, the two systems, and so ideally um, they should be able to, you know, the, the extracted data at least from the two should be able to um, be interoperable. There's a blue button um, option that's being explored, so kind of putting apps on top of the existing EHRs that are communicating with each other and that, I think, has had some success so far. So I, I just wanted to point out that while I think interoperability in that is, is, is a huge issue um, and, and an important issue to, to address, I think that, you know, as I think about standards and IT infrastructure, I'm thinking about it uh, at several lever levels before um, interoperability in the sense that um, there are um, uh, standard terminologies and standard representations of data that uh, go through and achieve a certification status by which any certified EHR would use that as their data standard. So as an example, at the present time, uh, we do not have any sort of uh, um, certified uh, nomenclature for representing uh, genomic variants in uh, the electronic health record. And so it really doesn't matter at what level you are interoperable if you don't have a data standard to represent the variant. Uh, even if you can move information back and forth, you don't know that you're necessarily moving the variant information in, in a uh, reliable way. And so I think in some sense uh, we may be at a more fundamental level uh, amongst the different groups, which is to say 
you know, what, what is it that we need? If we were going to implement genomic medicine, what do we need? Uh, we need genomic variants to be represented in a standardized way that we all agree on. We need to communicate those variants in a standardized way which we all agree on. There are groups like HL7 that are beginning to look at some of those standards. But what we don't have is the ability right now to move that through into a, into a formal certification process such, such that it becomes the standard for all EHRs that are going to use genomic data that this is a standard that will be used. And my contention would be is that if we got all of the players around the table to say here are the set of critical data elements and communication strategies that are needed and here are the standards that are needed and we all sort of marched metaphorically to the office of the ONC, um, then uh, we might have a shot at actually moving that through some type of a, uh, a certification for health IT, CHIT, or something of that nature. And then we have a standard that we can all build off of. Yes, I, I was going to say about the VA data. So the VA data, even without the DOD data, um, and we're still working on that. It's also above my, my pay grade as well. But um, I do think that it offers a number of things. One is that it is a national uh, data um, uh, looking at medical record, and I can go in and look at the medical record of someone in another state and use those data if I need to for my research. I do think that what it has taught us is that there are many gaps in these data, and um, we need um, not only standard ways of recording things, um, and that's a huge gap. Um, another is to um, understand how clinicians prefer to um, use the electronic record for these kinds of things. So I think one of the ways that the VA data is valuable right now is to look now at how it is being used to record these events. Um, so it does provide that. It provides a, a national way to look at a variation across the country as well. Terry. So I thought I'd move to where you guys didn't, or I didn't have to uh, strangle ourselves to, to get to a microphone. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, given the opportunity of, of the Defense Health Agency that we're, that we're hearing about, is there some way that, that we can link you, if you want us to, or whatever, um, with groups that, that are putting genomic information into medical record uh, in a standardized format, at least across those groups, to, to at least, you know, be able to see what kinds of standards they're proposing and whether you want to use them, or are those links already made and I should um, not bother you? First of all, there is keen interest, I think, on the behalf of, I shouldn't say all services at once, I can only speak to ours, but I think the Air Force would agree in this concept. But as far as the DHA, it is, it's not even an entity yet. And yet, the interest that you're speaking of is something that we can, at the appropriate time, fold in. But we have no idea yet as to what authorities it will have relative to each service's authorities on the activities of that service's research. That's how, that's how young it is. It's, it's coming. They've even nominated a, a, a head of it. But there's very little specifics at this point that would allow us to plug in the concepts that you're, you're proposing. But it's, we're, we're with you on, on trying to make something work at the appropriate timeline. Can either of you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, just to point out, I, I also sh serve on one of the shared services work groups for the DHA. And as Admiral Dole pointed out, the current issue has to do with just overcoming some of the statutory roadblocks that Congress built in years gone by in regard to how the services individually would govern themselves. And what that did, although we have a Department of Defense, there have always been concerns about equities and um, culture that Congress, having been made up in years gone by of individuals who have also served in the armed forces, have sought to permanentize. Now that we're moving forward to bring things together, there's no doubt that there is a bent to do so. However, 
recognizing the difficulty that Congress is having right now coming to consensus on a number of different items, we envision that it will take some time before some of these statutory barriers, which everyone agrees don't need to be there, but no one agrees as to how to take apart and how to merge, evolve. In the meantime, behind the scenes, as has been pointed out, we are working to try to pull this DHA together, but it's going to be an infant when it starts out, and it's going to build to be more robust, and we still don't know which appendages are going to grow first and which ones will be the laggards. So I would just add in the meantime, um, what I, my strategy for, for our program, since I've been asked to scale it back um, in the wake of the sequestration and, and cuts in our FY13 budget, um, my, my strategy has been to provide um, kind of a series of roadmaps for implementation of genomic medicine um, in our enterprise. Um, so using our, the Air Force dollars to, instead of figuring out how to do everything, at least uh, research how we might do things and, and provide suggestions on that so that that material is available. So in that spirit, um, even before DHA is, is stood up, I would still like to um, I, I would be happy to, to um, hear um, what IT solutions you may have out there because, you know, we're still voting on the logo for DHA. It's not, uh, it's, it's not there yet. That's usually the hardest discussion <laughs> is the logo. But, but an, an encouraging aspect, there are 10 areas that are being considered for, if you will, some degree of consolidation. One of them is IT. And of the areas, IT is one of the more promising ones given its relative age compared to how long research has been going on, how long logistics has been going on, et cetera. So my point being that in tying in with the Colonel's comments that that area has the most prom or what is one of the more promising areas that we could, when we talk about data mining and so on, that we may find ways to bridge across our system with whomever it is we're gonna interact with because there's a mindfulness to make the three services use the same database or, or certain software. Uh, Mark. I think the other thing that needs to be part of this um, uh, discussion, since there are research implications of this as well, is uh, the coming back to a point that was made earlier about um, uh, the use of um, uh, workarounds like natural language processing as opposed to using structured data. And I think another important thing is to identify those areas where the, we would, say, prioritize uh, data uh, and build systems by which the data would be entered uh, as structured data within the clinical encounter as opposed to those places where it may not be quite as critical um, uh, so that we can actually mu much more easily uh, access data uh, uh, for uh, research questions um, than we can if we're always dependent on either natural language processing with its uh, inherent problems and those uh, text blobs that don't lend themselves to NLP at all where we fall back on manual review which ultimately will, you know, stop us dead in our tracks. So that type of prioritization would also uh, be important. I'd, I'd like to um, think about broadening this discussion about IT uh, standards to two different areas. One has to do with clinical decision support, which was measure, mentioned earlier in the day, and make a recommendation that um, perhaps one, one could consider um, uh, a common uh, CDS repository that all systems could use as opposed to many systems creating their own CDS uh, frameworks. And I, th I think this may be, um, uh, you know, something that the, that the CDS consortium that you mentioned earlier is probably working on, but it sounds like that's sunsetting, so the question is where does it sunset to and one potential avenue for it to remain alive and to facilitate a lot of the healthcare delivery systems and the armed forces as well as uh, other stakeholders in the room might be to think about a CDS repository and, and, and have that as a, a standard set of tools. Do you want to comment on that, Mark? Yeah, the, um, I think one of the things, and, and uh, this is true probably with every consortia that's ever been constituted is that the con concept always seems a lot simpler at the beginning than it does when you drill down to the weeds. And so one of the challenges that the CDSC has experienced is that when you actually get down uh, into the coding uh, of the uh, clinical decision support, that that's when a lot of the interoperability 
uh, is lost because of the customization that's needed. And so that's, in some ways, is the holy grail in the, in the CDSC world is, can we, again, identify standards by which we could create CDS artifacts such that they could be much more readily uh, utilized um, in uh, electronic health records? Now, um, Cecily also mentioned um, another potential approach to this, which has been uh, presented to the eMERGE group, um, which is, uh, uh, I think at Harvard Partners of uh, what uh, Zach Kahani has been calling the smart uh, approach, which is where you actually uh, have an app that sits on top of an EHR and where you could have access to uh, cloud-based clinical decision support uh, hosted by anyone, uh, where you could import artifacts that would uh, through this app that would allow them to run uh, moving data back and through this port in a secure way to actually give you the information that you needed. And so those types of solutions beyond building everything into the EHR uh, may be more pragmatic uh, over time. But I think somebody, I know that there's a lot of um, enthusiasm amongst the groups that were uh, in the CDSC um, to continue the work that they're doing. The issue then is, you know, could we create a place where we could bring them together, take advantage of what they've learned and continue to play, but maybe with more of a focus on the things that we're particularly interested in. Yeah, so there's, there's certainly the, this technology uh, piece of the platform, which I, um, I admit sounds like it could be uh, challenging, but even uh, something uh, a little bit more pedestrian as a common set of rules that if somebody wanted to implement their own software, at least we have a common set of rules that are underlying uh, clinical decision support. So that was, I think, also implied in my rec my recommendation. The other area that I uh, think it sounds related to the second bullet here on evidence generation is uh, oftentimes during the day we talked about outcomes. And I think, again, Mark, you uh, and Dan had talked about the narrowness of some of the ways that we think about outcomes. Can we? Uh, together somehow expand that platform to uh, have patient-centered outcomes, um, systems types of outcomes as we might, you know, use uh, to, if we're managing a health system or managing a practice or even think about the providers as, uh, as part of the system that we want to measure so we can um, think about a, this um, framework for outcomes measures uh, that could be more or less uniform perhaps adopted to across a number of the groups here. So though, so. CDS and outcomes to me seem like they're uh, important parts of the, I, you know, where, where does the data reside, how do we capture it in order to make the measures as part of real time, real world care instead of doing RCTs and generating case report forms and things of that nature. Yeah, I think for the outcomes it wouldn't necessarily mean that you would always need to, um, you know, do the same thing, but I think what would be very useful there is to try and define the universe of outcomes and, and to uh, create a repository of here are all the possible outcomes that could be considered and here's where you might consider using this outcome versus that outcome. Dan and I were talking offline about the idea of a lot of the things that we default to um, primarily because they're easier to do is process outcomes and we assume that if you do something that's recommended like check an A1C or do a foot test or something like that, that that has actually some chain of evidence to the actual health outcome of interest. But in many cases, that chain of evidence is, if it exists at all, is, is fairly tenuous and wouldn't hold a lot of weight. So, um, but if we invest all of our effort in measuring process outcomes because they're technically easier, we lose the opportunity to develop methods by which we could perhaps measure true outcomes, uh, health outcomes that are really meaningful. Uh, uh, and that people uh, in the broader community would pay attention to uh, much more significantly because they directly relate to clinical utility. Um, and so I think some balance of the portfolio of outcomes and, and looking where uh, investments could really help to um, improve the ability to utilize certain sets of outcomes that seem to be most important for certain projects. Matching the outcomes to the project would be important. A couple of... Uh comments in that regard. First of all, I would, and I'm speaking here with very little knowledge, but CMS has this meaningful use uh, uh, payment program and whatever IT solution you discuss, should I would suggest involve those people to make sure that it meets those requirements. So that changing systems or implementing new systems helps providers get paid under the meaningful use uh, concept. Uh, 
secondly, um, part of the issue in measuring outcomes, as you said, is having simple ways to measure those. <coughs> CMS created and CPT followed um, codes for the PQRS system uh, for measuring outcomes. Some of those were processed, some of those were um, clinical outcomes, uh, blood pressure less than 140, uh, uh, one of those outcomes where CMS initially created what are called G codes and then CPT followed up with actual CPT, no, they followed up with F codes. Um, so if, if there are some outcomes that are developed and you're coordinating with CMS and doing that and they're meaningful use, quality outcome processes, then perhaps codes can be developed that will help measure the outcomes as you do that. Yeah, I think Steve raises an, an important point that, and actually I think this is the first time meaningful use criteria has been mentioned around the, the table, which is, which is unfortunate. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure particularly as, as the military starts to develop its system, it, probably that's not so terribly relevant to you, and yet it's what's driving a lot of the health IT outside. And, and if you can at least, you know, have some interface with it, it would be tremendously helpful. And just to speak to meaningful use, I mean, there have been a number of us that have been engaged with that process, either directly or indirectly, to try and get some of the things we've been talking about represented there. The reality, of course, is that as with everything else, um, you know, the groups um, to some degree sitting around this table are also at the informatics uh, leading edge, uh, and we're addressing problems that are, you know, well beyond the can of most systems that are trying to, you know, implement their first EHR or to use it for very basic clinical processes. So in some sense, the meaningful use process as it's currently constituted um, has been focused on uh, those um, uh, lower level uh, types of things and it's been more difficult to get uh, even things like meaningful use of family history represented in the, um, in the meaningful use uh, targets. Um, so. As an example, even though a meaningful use of laboratory information, communication of laboratory information and electronic means from a laboratory information system to an electronic health record is part of phase one meaningful use, um, the issue that some of us raised, which is, well, you know, genetic tests are laboratory tests, um, that should be explicitly articulated as part of the ability to do that. That was essentially put on the back burner. So um, I, I understand the pragmatic uh, realities of trying to get that program up and running, but, and I agree with you that we should try as much as we can to continue to engage and move things through meaningful use because if we can get it there, then it's really going to have a major impact. The challenge has been is that just the, it ha the, the audience has not been particularly receptive to these types of use cases, which are well beyond where most systems are operating. If uh, <clears throat> CMS is a huge agency, um, uh, not a lot of conversations, com it's not uncommon for conversations to never be had between the various <laughs> versions of that, the sections of that particular agency. Um, I think some of the implementation of meaningful use might be in, in the areas that you mentioned might be helpful, might be improved if there were other people within the agency who are interested in outcomes were, were involved in providing that input to those particular folks. So if we can get the right people discussing it outside of this group, but the right people within the agency, essentially the coverage people saying we need data, this data needs to be uh, clinically available, meaningful use needs to include the ability to collect this data, <coughs> and there may be a better, there may be some better outcomes than what have been seen in phase one. We'll take names. I have names. <laughs> <laughs> My name isn't on there, but we have names. <laughs> <laughs> So, so maybe we can bring the section to close, but and not, and not to put you on the spot, Deborah. But in your discussions at CAP, has there been discussion about uh, reporting standards for uh, genomic data as as you've thought about your framework? Um, yes, one of the things we wanted was um, the we're, we're going to be advocating for more standardized model report templates for genomic test reporting 
that will be useful not only to the clinical end users, but also reports that potentially could be understandable by patients themselves. Um, because the PHR, I mean, it's one thing that we talk about the um, healthcare providers not necessarily understanding the results that they're getting, but these are going to potentially go into the PHR and patients are going to see them directly. <coughs> so yes, it is one of the things that we're advocating for. And if I can follow up on that, Deborah, um, is uh, the recommendation that it ha has been made in some venues to move to a synoptic type of report, uh, which is u in regular use in anatomic pathology uh, and has been discussed in the context of uh, genetic and genomic test reports, is that under discussion as well? Well, that, that's a model that could be considered because the synoptic reports have been very um, useful for incorporated incorporation into um, COPATH and, and other laboratory information systems and standardizes and makes sure that um, the clinically essential information around cancers is reported in every single surgical pathology report related to that cancer. And so the same type of process could be developed around um, genomic test reporting. Could you, just for the great unwashed of which I'm one, what is a synoptic report? Oh, it's, a, it's basically a report template that says that, you know, this is a such and such a cancer and then there are specific things that are reported as to the size, the nearness to the margin, the number of nodes involved. Did you see? Yes, and so it provides it in a very structured um, format um, that's easily searchable um, right. afterward. I think it's still, I don't think it's still in separate fields. I think it's still within. Um, it's still in a text document, although text there, are, document, there, are yeah. some, there are some systems that it lends itself to creating a, uh, um, a structured document. And in fact, uh, one of the things that CMS is uh, specifically <laughs> investing in through meaningful use is the use of so-called continuity of care documents, which are clinical document architectures that are both machine and human readable, so that the critical information is represented both as text that a human can parse, but also as structured data that a machine can parse. And so this would be, I think, if CAP is involved in this, um, that would be a model um, uh, to uh, look to move to that would, I think, uh, make it much easier to uh, approach uh, meaningful use, uh, uh, and that's something that the HL7 Genomics Work Group has been uh, looking into in terms of developing these types of uh, uh, CDAs uh, that can lead to continuity care documents. All right. I, I think maybe we should move on, but I'd like to go out of order because it sort of follows the idea of a curated database. There's, so there's been a fair amount of work we had, actually Mark and I co-chaired a meeting a year and a half ago now about um, uh, what we're now calling a clinical, clinical no, CRVR, so <laughs> variance re resource. So I, I don't, Terry, I don't know if you can uh, maybe give a brief description of that so that people who don't know about it are aware of it and um, maybe comment on how far you think that would go to providing uh, a curated database that some people have uh, referred to? Sure. Well, and, and I might know that there are there are many curated databases that people are, are have been discussing. So, so one curated database is is the very small subset of genetic variants that might have some clinical action that needs to be taken on them. What have, has been called actionable variants, um, and that is a term that has you know uh, various meanings to various people. But what the clinically relevant variants resource is is designed, and we, we purposely picked a, a really long and ugly name so that somebody would come up with something way better. Um, but the, the way better ones that we had were either objectionable to some or they were already taken. So, um, but, but be that as it may, um, what we're trying to do is to get a, a, a group, a consensus basically of experts, and one can define them in any way one, one wants, um, to tell us and the, the research community what are the variants that there is really pretty strong evidence that you know, you can do something about, that they're important, they have an, a, an important impact on risk, and that that risk is modifiable. Um, and so far, you know, most of those that have come up have been um, either the, the hereditary cancer syndromes where one would, would give advice for more frequent screening even in the patient, but certainly in the patient's relatives who carry that variant, um, or for some of the pharmacogenomic uh, uh, variants as, as well. Um, but there are, are undoubtedly others, and the, the goal of this group is to survey the literature on an ongoing basis 
um, and, and the available evidence and basically make recommendations as to which are those that, that should be considered in that realm. Um, and so it's, it's something that we've uh, engaged several of the other in institutes in. There's a lot of interest, um, unfortunately not a lot of resources, but a lot of interest in, in helping us to get that off the ground. And we hope to be able to announce awards very, very soon, you know, hopefully uh, early this summer. Um, so that's what, what that particular database is. There are other databases, maybe I, I might ask David Ledbetter to, to comment, um, on just looking at, at all of the variants that are identified in clinical laboratories that, that are, are doing sequencing, either targeted sequencing or other, other kinds of sequencing, and when these variants are picked up, they're useful both being linked to phenotypic information and not linked to phenotypic information. David, can you comment a bit? Yeah, just for the group, Liz Mansfield mentioned it briefly in her talk. There was a group that was based on whole genome copy number variation that was called ISCA uh, that was a uh, voluntary um, collaboration among clinical cytogenetics testing labs to deposit their whole genome CNV data along with whatever phenotypic data came in with laboratory test requests uh, into dbGaP. And then that data would also, uh, the calls, the variant calls, and clinical information into ClinVar. So it's been a collaboration with NCBI through dbGaP and ClinVar for several years. And in the last year, we've reached out to the molecular diagnostic uh, genetic testing labs to talk about the problems of acquiring genotype and phenotype data as the basis for evidence-based review of what's clinically relevant, the problems being the same for sequence variation as they are for structural variation and some of the evidence-based review processes that we had developed would be useful to evaluating the level of evidence around genes first and then variants within those genes uh, in terms of what's clinically relevant. It didn't. In our definitions, it never included actionability, actionability as opposed to evidence that the gene was associated with disease or phenotype and that the variant was a functionally important variant. Um, so those two communities have come together and applied for a U41 um, database grant through Genome starting a little over a year ago and sent a revised submission still prior to the uh, CRVR RFA. Uh, that application included a major partnership and collaboration again with uh, NCBI ClinVar but also with some other uh, database groups and with some international participation. Um, <clears throat> um, No, no, I'm, I'm trying to, still trying to think of the order. When the CRVR RFA came out, we then contacted colleagues uh, and were active participants in constructing one of the CRVR applications, and there was some degree of overlap in the, in the, um, the work around curation, because both the database required curation and the CRVR resource required curation. Um, so that was with um, one of the CRVR applications, and we're all now waiting to see what the final uh, proposal is, but all of the groups involved are very eager to work together and figure out the most efficient system to come up with standards for evidence review, collect as much data as possible as a byproduct of clinical care. Um, generating whole genome data, either structural variant information or sequencing information. So, so I think this is one where I'm, I'm tempted to declare victory and move on. Um, <laughs> oh, you won't let me get away with that, huh? What, one, of the, one of the frustrations that the college has, the College of American Pathologists has, is that much of the work is focused on inherited disorders. And, um, and not a lot on cancer. So I don't know what the cancer resources are, and I don't know if the FDA project is looking at both cancer and inherited. And, and I know with the RFAs that were put out, um, it included cancer, but m most of the respondents are likely to focus on the inherited uh, first, and yet cancer is one of the areas where the genomics is 
kind of moving very, very rapidly and definitely is tied to therapeutic implications. And so I, I wonder why this, I mean, maybe it comes from NHGRI having more of a genetic focus and NCI being cancer, but it, it I think, is detrimental to the thinking about a, a curated database or databases by not including the somatic uh, variants related to cancer. Can I make a comment? We, we are certainly very interested in, in somatic variants. Um, one of the reasons why maybe it has not been as big on the radar screen is some of this data is generated and held by pharma companies, the people who are developing the drugs, or it's not the same sort of research-based enterprise, you know, publicly funded research and so on. Um, but we are also looking through, we have a program in CDRH called MDIC, and don't ask me what that stands for because I can't remember, where it's supposed to be um, a, a sort of pre-competitive space where diagnostic companies and other companies can get together. And one of our ideas was to actually um, try to move them into this database idea because it has regulatory benefits for them. You know, if we can, if they can point to the database and say, see, it's there, it's, it's, in, it's in cancer and it responds to this, you know, we don't need to do a clinical trial for the test or whatever, then, you know, I, I could see where it would be beneficial for them. But that, that's still pretty nascent. But I think what you're looking at is a completely different kind of enterprise, not publicly funded research base, but, but industrial. And, and one of the things that a lot of this testing is being done in pathology departments, and so one of the things that, that the CAP is looking at is developing an academic consortium um, of pooling data across cancer, um, clinical cancer testing, so that we can see what other people are seeing rather than laboratory by laboratory. Maybe I could... I could ask our, our NCI colleagues, so I know Andrew Friedman was here and probably still is, um, and, and Muin as, as well, perhaps you could comment a bit on the, the somatic and the, and the germline interests in both, both in our resource and in the resources that you all have. So I'll take off my CDC hat, put on my NCI hat. So we, <coughs> we have a definite keen interest in the, the cancer genome. I mean, the, as you know, there, <coughs> there has been TCGA, which is a big NCI initiative now. In collaboration. In collaboration with, with Genome. genome. Yeah, yeah, what's yeah, that yeah. name and of the isn't institute? It, and isn't it half and half? Is there, uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, <laughs> oops. Um, <laughs> now, okay, I was going to go into the it's database. Money for a poor institute to spend on yeah. one disease. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we definitely have keen interest in databases. So, uh, as part of the uh, CRVR discussion, I think uh, we may be heading in that direction as well. I mean, it's too early to tell right now, but sooner or later, uh, and I'm glad that FDA is also interested in this, so maybe we can have an uh, offline chat later on about trying to have that resource for the community uh, <coughs> co-constructed by FDA, NCI, and HGRI, and whoever else wants to uh, be on it. And, and I don't mean to malign the TCGA effort because it's amazing and doing good things, but clinically, you look at that information and you have no idea what to do with it. So it is, it's, it's not tied to clinical outcomes or drug responses or anything. So it's this huge catalog of information that you don't know how to use clinically. Uh, that, that's TCG2. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, the pro sequel. I, I'm the program okay, so, director. Okay, so when is that happening, and and what what's going to happen with that data? I, I, and actually, TCGA is winding. It's 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 on a trajectory to be over in about two years, with its goals of sequencing more than 10,000 tumors from 26 different cancer types. You know, just this huge discovery effort that'll be complete in about two years, and then we're working with NCI now. Uh, to develop the next iteration of projects, which which we re is we recognize has to include treatment outcomes and that sort of data, but it's under development. Whether uh, this fits or not, there are uh, over the last decade there have been a handful of databases created as a result of CMS coverage decisions. 
uh, a requirement to get paid that includes submitting data to these databases. And there have been thousands and in some cases millions of patient, uh, uh, patient information submitted to those. Most in cardiology, implantable defibrillators, carotid stents, uh, ventricular assist devices, PET scanning has one. Uh, and all of those as a result of what I just mentioned briefly in my presentation of this coverage with evidence de development concept. <coughs> There's challenges in doing that. There's sometimes um, um, dangers in taking coverage decisions to CMS and that they may decide um, things that you don't want them to decide. But at least in your your considerations of how to get people to submit data to whatever database you have, um, exploring that option may be beneficial. Yeah, I just want to throw out as a follow-up to the cancer question, coming at this from more of a research angle, you know, we have projects like the Thousand Genomes Project out there, TCGA, you know, clinical sequencing that's going on. I mean, it would be really good, as one of the speakers mentioned earlier, that if there could be sort of flow in both directions. And, you know, we have data formats like VCF files and formats, you know, that if we could sort of standardize that somehow across the disciplines, so that should be a benefit. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Rex that this is a success, but I think what we do need to look at are the rules of putting anything into a database. And I think if we can have some um, standardization of you know, be it informed consent, be it notification, would you allow limitations? I think we're all under some different HIPAA rules in terms of sharing across institutions. I think it would be great value added if we could kind of hold hands and really chart out something that would work for a lot of institutions. I know a lot of the DOD has some different regulations as well. So anyway, just to, as a little yeah. asterisk. I think in our effort, one of the things we recognized, even if a database is curated, they're not all curated the same way. There's not a set of rules that everybody's agreed on. And a lot of things that are called databases are really repositories. Um, and and there's, a, there's a huge difference between a curated database and a repository. So, you know, some kind of like industry standard rule or something like that for what a curated quality database would mean would, would be really interesting. So I think in this general area of standards, IT infrastructure, and curated databases, uh, we've heard from everybody sitting around, or many people sitting around the table, that this is really a common theme that crosses all of the agencies that, or most of the agencies that, that are here. So <clears throat> we put, put that aside, and I think that's something that we should probably think of as we come to what next okay. steps are that there's clearly some work that we could all work together on in the area of standards IT infrastructure and uh, curated databases. So, D Dan? I, mean, I just wanted to make sure that we sort of say it right, that the, the database, the curated databases we're talking about are not just collections of genomic variants, but they're coupled to patient outcomes. And because uh, I think that's the only way that we're going to figure out what the rare variants do going forward. Uh, not an original idea. but. I, I think an important point. Maybe we use that as an example to, or a basis to move on to the next one. One of the other things we heard arise several times in the discussion today was the need for more evidence. More evidence to support that genetic variants actually are, whether it's actionable or actually have clinical validity, uh, we need to be working together to think about evidence generation. So. Um, be interested in hearing, uh, again, just sort of from folks around the table, what are the important next steps in terms of evidence generation? For example, is there an opportunity in the evidence generation to leverage the large amount of data that's in the VA system or that will be in the military health care systems or that are obviously in a large number of um, academic or even uh, non-academic healthcare systems. Uh, what, what's the role for CMS in this? Is there data that CMS has access to that would help in the evidence generation piece? 
Well, one of the issues I see in sitting and listening to all the different um, groups uh, talking is that there seem to be basically different statutory rules um, by which each group operates that actually prevents um, coordination across the agencies and, and groups and, and closer alignment and coordination of the work being done. So how does this tie to evidence? I think each group has a different definition of what the evidence, quote, evidence is that they need for their particular <coughs> purpose. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't know how you get to alignment of evidence without um, dealing with that issue. But maybe that's too difficult. Well, I wonder if it, it may be useful to ask both the, the folks familiar with newborn screening and, and those familiar with the EGAP process what evidence was, I mean, did you have challenges getting everybody to agree on what evidence was enough or, or what evidence you used? And, and maybe tell us a bit about how we might use that experience to figure out what standards we might want to have here. Well, from the newborn screening perspective, I think most of us would agree that the vast majority of evidence that we're um, discussing uh, is consensus-based uh, using uh, experts. Um, now, uh, I think that you could make a pretty strong argument that if you look at the initial disorders for newborn screening, like PKU and, uh, and galactosemia and this sort of thing, that uh, it, it, you didn't necessarily need to do a randomized uh, placebo-controlled double-blind study to see that reducing the phenylalanine in the diet, you know, had profound impact on the uh, children. Uh, that were identified as having phenylketonuria. Mm -hmm. um, but if you ask that question a different way, which is to say, well, what's the treatment target of phenylalanine, serum phenylalanine, that we should be uh, targeting our treatment to, we've been treating this disease for 60 years, and there's no evidence to suggest that we understand, you know, what that phenylalanine level should be uh, that gives optimal outcomes relating to cognition and, and other things. And uh, up until relatively recently, uh, it was really thought appropriate care to discontinue dietary restrictions at age six when brain development was quote unquote complete. And I think we now know that that's a very different story. So um, uh, the, the, the point of that, um, in, in addition to being responsive to your question, is, is that when we talk about evidence, there's you know, vast differences in terms of the levels of evidence that can be used, and there's vast differences in terms of the outcomes of interest. And so if your outcome of interest is let's prevent profound mental retardation and uh, seizures and a child that needs to be institutionalized, there's sufficient evidence uh, to say that dietary restriction. If your evidence is we want to optimize cognitive outcome and minimize the impact on patients in terms of the dietary restriction, that we do not have sufficient evidence. And so I think this, what that really constitutes is what uh, Deb is saying, which is, you know, we need to be able to agree on, you know, what are the outcomes that are of interest and what level of evidence do we need uh, to uh, achieve those outcomes? And, um, and you really can't separate one from the other. If you don't understand what the outcomes that you're looking at are, you can't decide what the evidence is. Um, and, but we really don't even have any venues by which we can have these discussions uh, other than the, uh, I think the attempts by Muin and others to pull together stakeholder groups, including NHGRI, to say, you know, can we talk about this? Um, but there's none of these have had a sustainable effort where we've had any sort of tangible output to say, here, is, here are the considerations to be able to um, uh, pick this level of evidence for this particular condition. How many, you know, what's the prevalence? How many patients are involved? What's the outcomes, et cetera? At, at the very least, we should have a framework of deciding how to match outcomes and evidence. And, and even across the agencies, it seems that there's different evidence needed by um, CMS, private payers, FDA, you know, military health care is, is for, I forget what you called it, but for the military person's functionality in the field or whatever. I mean, so, so there are different criteria and of what's trying to be achieved. And so I don't know if you're going to get a consensus about the evidence that's needed because um, everybody's looking at different parts of the elephant, if you will. 
if we had something like the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, I mean, so some kind of nationally recognized body that determined what those standards are and gave graded levels of evidence, I, I don't think anybody could argue with that. Right, but how much of medical practice is covered by the USPSTF guidelines? Not a whole lot. And, and so there's a lot out there to, to, to drive the use of genomics or not um, in, in care. And I don't know that that level of guidelines and evidence is going to be possible for everything. I don't, I don't. But you're, right. you're right. When that does exist, it does drive consensus. Well, and, and I guess I might, or just if I could jump in, I, I, I might ask, you know, whether we really need to define what evidentiary standards each agency would use, or we ask them each to define it for themselves. But, but the evidence generation is likely to be in the same or similar platforms and collecting the same or similar information. And however it, it gets used, I mean, yes, it would be nice to know exactly how a given agency is going to use it and be sure that we collect that information. But absent that, there's probably an awful lot. We could probably get 90 percent of the information, I'm just guessing, um, that, that one would need it at any given agency that might be common across all of them. And, and that may be where we want to start. And then perhaps that would drive some thinking as to, you know, what is it specific to readiness or that's specific to CMS reimbursement or specific specific to FDA regulation, whatever it might be. Yeah, <clears throat> I was thinking about how to um, tackle this one. Um, so if the purpose of the genomic medicine <clears throat> enterprise is to implement genomic tools, then <clears throat> we develop the, those tools, you develop those tools, and then you subject them to the current requirements by FDA, CMS. Arc, whatever, and, and at the end of the day, you wonder why they're not being implemented because they don't fit with the current evidentiary. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a messed up system, as you know. I mean, the the uh, SACGHS looked at the oversight. There was an oversight report in 2008 uh, was published, which has a very extensive analysis of the uh, oversight uh, trajectory for. You know, when the FDA steps in, CMS, CLIA, and then you have professional organizations. Um, it's, it's a patchwork of work. But what you have to realize is that if there is no genetic exceptionalism, and I've heard that mentioned a few times, then those new tools, no matter how cool they are, they have to lead to some measurable outcomes. We can debate what those outcomes are. And they are very specific depending on what the context is. So for diagnostic purposes, for a rare disease, the end of a diagnostic odyssey may be an outcome. Okay, that's, that's fine, even though there is no treatment, but at least you get the diagnosis. If you're trying to do screening the whole population, you know, the principles of population screening have to be adopted. If you're trying to um, do a companion diagnostic uh, a la FDA where you, the treatment matches with a, uh, with a test, whether it's a genomic or some other test, then there are evidentiary requirements. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel on this. I think the wheel has been invented. There are enough, uh, I mean, I see that uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> shaking your head, I, I think that's positive. Sometimes sometimes you shake your head in a negative way. No, I'm agreeing with you. I also think we need to appreciate that probably regulatory and, yeah. say, payer requirements are going to be different because there are going to be different standards yeah. for releasing something into commerce versus what a, you know, a prudent payer who is really a fiduciary of the, uh, of, of the monies of all of these people who pay yeah. insurance premiums is going to have to value to buy. I, I don't think, it, at right. least in our sociopolitical science, that they would, they might have harmony, but they would so, not be right. the well, same. I was going to go and, uh, <clears throat> Lizzie, I'll, I'll give you the okay. floor in just a minute. Is that, okay, we have all these new tools. We think they uh, improve outcomes. Let's test them. Let's test them out. There is a, <clears throat> and it doesn't have to be all by NHGRI. Uh, I mean, many of them are disease-specific tools, like, you know, heart, lung, blood, cancer. I mean, get the NIH community to buy in, get the private sector to buy in, and let's start doing some of, whenever they're needed, some of the trials that need to be done, the RCTs, and occasionally, when they're not needed, you can do the observation studies while you build the clinical infrastructure like eMERGE and electronic health records to, to supplement clinical trials with observation data. So there is really nothing magical about uh, evidence. It, it has to be collected. We can't 
pretend that we don't need it because at the end of the day, we need it one way or another. We need the evidence. Otherwise, genomic medicine will not be implemented. So uh, let's you know, do our horizon scanning, figure out what the, the applications are, and then depending on what the application is, and I'm suspecting all the roads will converge to next generation <coughs> sequencing at some point, uh, rather than gene by gene type analysis, then I, I think you know those can be subjected to the already known and established uh, principles of evidence and see what kind of studies need to be supported, whether new RFAs are needed, and so on and so forth. So, uh, no new territory needs to happen here. I think it's uh, same old. So I, I think there is a good rule of th sort of rule of thumb in the diagnostics literature about observational versus RCT. Uh, you, you know, most diagnostic literature is observational. Uh, or it's, it, uh, it's, that's not fair. It's, it, it, it's comparative, but it's not RCTs. But really the area where RCTs become urgently needed is when you're either de defining a new disease or a new spectrum of disease. So we need to be, th maybe thinking in, uh, a um, uh, kind of a field with, all right, is this something that re re replaces or improves or maybe doesn't improve a known way of diagnosing, a known strategy and interventions that follow it? Or is it actually going into unknown territory where we are really not clear what the, what the disease is or whether we have found a whole uh, you know, group of individuals who's been under the radar because they weren't detectable, and, and does that mean they need to be treated, or should they be left alone? You know, some of the some of the um, high technology uh, breast imaging has brought up that issue with respect to its um, uh, actually increasing the mastectomy rate. Good, bad, I don't know. Oh, I was going to say I, I don't think we want to sing. Uh, you, you know, it's kind of like. I hate this phrase anymore because everybody uses it for everything, but fit for purpose in evidence. You don't want to wait until you have a reimbursement level of evidence necessarily because then nothing's ever getting on the market, frankly. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a tension there that, but, but you have to start somewhere. And, and when I talked about evidence in my talk, I was primarily thinking about um, cancer and, and targeted drugs where you're actually using a companion diagnostic. And now there's, I don't know how many companies with these panels, and doctors will order them, and it says, well, you have a KRAS mutation in your, you know, osteosarcoma. Maybe, you know, you should be treated with this drug when, in fact, nobody's ever studied in that population. You know, it, it's, it's, that's the kind of thing that can really derail because everybody's doing their own thing. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think you need to define what the context of your evidence gathering is, obviously. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm from CMS with Dr. Furrow, and um, all of this, it's, it's probably a more shameless uh, suggestion than anything else, but if this really were something that, that a group wanted to take on and, and try to take, try to get some traction with, um, I think in what you're talking about with the, with the KRAS test, I think the existing CPT codes that, that CMS is wrestling with right now um, would potentially be a really good place to start. Um, the information um, that CMS is given, um, frankly, comes from industry, it comes from commercial research, um, private research, and so there's not a lot that we get to see. Um, I would love for a group like this to tear into some of those tests and some of the CPT codes and see um, what came out of that, and I would suspect that there would be some, um, there would be many generalizable points across the tests that are currently marketable, that are currently out there, um, that could then be applied to um, tests that are coming down the pipeline. Um, and so, again, the shameless part is that it would make our job significantly easier. Um, but again, I, I think when you think of low-lying fruit, I think um, there, there potentially would be something there. So one, uh, one suggestion, thinking about this discussion, would be as, um, as uh, Genome and NIH, NCI, think about doing demonstration projects, um, outcomes-oriented, 
clinical utility studies with genome-based technologies, uh, one of the things that's absent from the discussion, particularly when pointy-headed academics are designing these studies, is, you know, is, is really engagement of the FDA and CMS and the payers and what are they looking for in terms of the evidence or the outcomes to be <coughs> measured. So it, it seems like um, a no-brainer to, to design these studies with the stakeholders that eventually have to make the decisions about coverage and um, regulatory pathways uh, to be at the beginning rather than you get to the end and then you realize you've done the wrong study. Uh, so I'm just suggesting that there may be some ways to engage uh, in some of the efforts that are currently being teed up by uh, NIH to um, deliver on the evidentiary generation uh, component to really engage some of the other stakeholders around the table at the very beginning of designing those studies. Uh, so I think um, Elizabeth has really identified something on the horizon which is critically important. So maybe is an opportunity. So often we're, you know, instead of looking at the horizon, chasing it. Um, there are now on, on the market all kinds of proprietary multi, multi, <laughs> multi biomarker tests that anybody with a cancer uh, has their tumor evaluated by. What well, the good part is, uh, it reflects the, the understanding of uh, cancer at its uh, molecular basis, not so much uh, the, uh, the convention of a, a site-specific disease. Um, the downside is nobody is really assessing this data and understanding where it's going, so it's becoming kind of a uh, you know, quite a random occurrence being applied to patient treatment. I, I think it is uh, critically important, and it's it's out there right now. It's being marketed right now. Oops, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I just wanted to. Um, the college is very aware of all the different cancer gene panels that are being developed, and we actually have a work group in the Personalized Healthcare Committee that is trying to design a quote, recommended cancer gene panel that would be pretty inclusive um, and could be used across all solid tumors. Now, payers aren't going to like this, but academics are going to like it because right now, if we did try to pool <coughs> data, those people who are doing gene panels, it's pretty easy to add some genes or remove some genes that people don't think is useful once you're doing next-gen sequencing for cancers. Um, and if there was standardization of the panel, it would facilitate combining the, the, the studies being done with the outcomes, I mean, the tests being done at different clinical centers. And so I don't know if this is something NCI wants input on or someone else wants input on, but we, we would very much like, you know, this not to be a college-specific activity, but we're making a start. Um, Mark Retain, I, I think it's even more complicated because um, tumors are known to be heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. So you can't simply say a tumor has mutation X. You can say, expert, you know, you can do quantitative allele calls, and people are now trying to develop models of clonal evolution and things like that. So I, I would be careful about building something now that isn't going to be appropriate as we learn more about the evolutionary structure of tumors and how that relates to biomarkers. Do we want to target the major clone or maybe we want to target the minor clone? But when I talk about a gene panel, it's actually a very large gene panel. It's not like a 48 gene panel. It's more like 500 so that we could do that kind of process of looking at the rarer clones, the recurrences when they come back. I mean, so you would have clinical data that could help with these kinds of pathways and evolution uh, discovery processes. Well, but you need quantitative information as well. You need spatial information. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's very, I mean. Yeah, pathologists are very aware of that. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I think <laughs> the informaticists are struggling with how to even represent the data. So it's, um, as we've talked to Bob Grossman in our place, it's like, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, this is all research at this point. It, this is not ready for prime time from the standpoint of tumor heterogeneity. It, it's not ready for prime time, but there are markers and variants that are ready for prime time use. And so you would, 
you're basically setting, we're trying to set up a model that begins to be able to do clinical trials based on the pathways affected rather than the tissue of origin because, like you were saying, if, you, if you've got a, a KRAS and an osteosarcoma, do you, you don't know what that does. But we would be able to begin to look across tissue types and tumor types um, with the same gene panel. So I, I just want to push this idea one step further because I think Deborah is saying let's, you know, let's set up a systematic way of collecting it. But I, I yes. believe, you know, kind of the other comments here on the table is, so w what is uh, the approach that you take in, in, in studying this, assessing it? It's very much a living, evolving mm -hmm. uh, type of process right now. Clinical decisions are being made based on that. And I don't know if they're good or bad for patients. Right. And so how's this going to get figured out? It's extraordinarily complex. And, um, you know, I, I would applaud the brilliant community of minds who could figure out how to approach this and then push to get it done, understanding that it'll keep moving. So, so one thing I, I might suggest or maybe we could consider, it sounded as though um, somebody around the table or several were, were making the case for getting um, advice early on as studies are being designed as to what would be the most useful information to FDA or CMS or, or payers or, or other groups. And so NHGRI has this genomic medicine demonstration projects uh, program that is about to get started. Um, and we would be delighted to, to show you the programs that we're planning to do and, and you know, obviously you can't completely redesign them, but if it were possible for you all to, to say, you know, it, this is, you have to say this is great, um, but after you say this is great, <laughs> you, you can then say, um, you know, it would be even greater if you could add on this little piece or if you collected this piece of information would be tremendously valuable to us, something that we might not even have thought about. I know when Howard McLeod was, was here in some of these discussions a, a couple of uh, meetings ago, he said, you know, the, the it was a, a payer that wanted to look at some outcome. I, I, it wasn't reducing hospitalization. It was something even simpler than adherence. that. Pardon me? It was, it was adherence. adherence. Yeah. And they, you know, adherence to a scientist is like, ah, you know, that's soft science. Um, but extremely important to the payers. And so there's probably things that we haven't even thought about. And if there are folks at, at CMS and FDA who hopefully will not tell us, oh, no, you can't do that, um, because that's what makes people afraid to then consult you, uh, it, it would be, I think, really great to have you engaged. One of the challenges that CMS has a little bit different than FDA. When you go to FDA and FDA says, bring me two randomized trials or one randomized trial and three firstborns or something, <laughs> they have you know, some fairly clear guidance. CMS says, bring us evidence that's reasonable and necessary. And they don't define that. Uh, and, they, and there is no, while CMS commonly will meet and likes to meet with trial designers before they begin their trial, they will not say, if you design the trial this way with these outcomes, here's what we'll do. Because they will not predefine those RNN uh, decisions. The, the process is also a good bit different in that uh, FDA says, do this, and then behind closed, bring us this information behind closed doors, except for their, their um, um, advisory committee. Um, comes up to the decision and publishes it and it's effective. In the CMS world, if you're doing a national decision, you have this process that includes public comment on a draft decision. Um, and so, so there are some differences that make that particular issue of saying, here's what we, if you do this, if you bring us this kind of trial with these kinds of outcomes, here's the results you'll get. Uh, you can't get that from CMS. They will. They, they will, this is in the coverage group, they will tell you, you know, FDA told you this is what you needed to do. It would be very helpful to us if you added this particular outcome or if you looked at this age group or if you stratified by 65 plus or some of those things that they commonly ask for. And if you read their decisions, you could ascertain on your own, but they will tell you that but there are no guarantees as to what they'll do with that information. 
and, and yeah, I don't, I don't think that, at least that wasn't what I was suggesting. It was just what, what would be useful to, to you all that, that we could generate if possible. And unless something has changed in the last week or changes in the next few weeks, they're not going to say, here's some guidelines for this general classification of trials. Sure. They'll not do that. But, but I think the question is more broadly, uh, are, are you, are, are, is CMS and is FDA and some of the other folks sitting around the table interested in being involved in those discussions for how to generate that evidence? It, it is a coverage issue more than it is a payment issue, and I don't wear that hat any longer. Um, my assumption, based upon what I've heard the current director say, is that he would be happy to do that. But we'll have to ask him directly. Because I think one of the one of the one of the goals that we want to do. So I, we've talked about standards, IT, and databases. That's that's clearly one area. Second area is this area of evidence generation. I think what we want to come to in you know half an hour or a little longer maybe is. Are there ways that the people sitting around the table should be engaged after we leave this room to move this agenda forward? We've heard how important it is. We've heard how it's not always been easy in the past when people have tried it, but is it time to make an, another run at it? You know, for me, one of the other things that I'm struck by is the point that's been made a couple of times today that you know, healthcare reimbursements are likely to change. The way healthcare is provided is likely to be changing. I, strikes me as a particularly good time for us to be having these discussions because then we're at the table when the decisions are being made as opposed to having to retrofit everything into what the new world order looks like. Um, so it, 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 it seems to me, uh, you know, 15 years of frustration for you and aside, I think now may be a particularly important time uh, for us to be revisiting this and thinking about how do we sustain the conversation and the activities after we leave here. Okay. There's, there's someone behind you, but there's also. Did you want to say yeah. something too? Um, I just had a comment about the different evidentiary thresholds that everyone has for, for good reasons, FDA, CMS, professional guidelines groups, I mean, all of the <laughs> gatekeepers that we refer to. I would imagine, too, that bringing a group of people that are interested in discussing this to the table can come to some common evidentiary standards that are baseline so that researchers and people in community settings can understand what that is and then can focus on that. And I think this is what Rex is also talking about because then it, you know, what we haven't discussed but I'm sure we'll be discussing in time is that unless we do that, then health disparities and disparities of care based on whether CMS is covering it or whether the institution is going to absorb the costs because it's unethical not to do it and with moving standards of care, which we don't really have standards of care in genomic medicine, you know, that, that just feeds into the cycle of if it's not covered, then we have disparities in care. So I would imagine that there are common, some commonalities amongst all of the different gatekeepers that can be shared with the researchers around this table and also with the community um, environment in the community hospitals so they can strategically plan uh, because I think that's one of that that's a really difficult um, area to plan for especially with um, mixed pay you know large payer mixes yes yeah, so, so one point that might be another bullet point up here several speakers brought up earlier um, you know is the idea that we have to develop a genomic medicine plan that is effective with everybody in the population, and that we know from projects like Thousand Genomes that, you know, we've sequenced 1,092 people now and have a pretty good handle on how demographic history is different all over the world. So somehow that has to be layered on top of this whole thing. Can, can I make a 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I was going to recommend we have a draft guidance out that should be going final soon on clinical studies or clinical trials or something like that that may answer a lot of questions that people have. I mean, we've actually, it's a long guidance, talks about how to do studies and so on, might be worth looking at. Um, the other thing is, you know, being really blunt here, genomic medicine, if you're worried about what FDA wants here, you know, we don't, we, we still are practicing enforcement discretion for laboratory developed tests. And you may have noticed that we have yet to approve anything in next generation sequencing. We have approved very few genetic tests. So if you think you need FDA input on all of this, I mean, that, that's kind of a joke. It's, you don't. You can go straight to market. You can make anything you want. You can sell it to anyone you want. Just call it an LDT. Um, you can take that as a tongue-in-cheek remark or not. But, <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah. So I just, I just want to, you know, don't. Yeah, I think if I can jump in, and I'm sorry, Naomi, but, but I think what at least some of us are asking is how can we work with you rather than outside of you? Um, and and there, there could be some ways in which we can generate information that might be helpful to you or perhaps not. Um, but uh, but that's, that's more, I think, so can, I, can I respond to that? Yeah, so I think that's really great, and we're happy to work with people. And, and I'm not kidding about that. Anybody, academics, we don't care. What we don't want to do is invest, I think, a tremendous amount of time in advising people what FDA would like to see and then you go off and do whatever you want you offer as an LDT. Because then we've just poured a whole bunch of time and money down, down the rat hole, and we still have no idea how the test works. So, you know, serious inquiries only. I, I, I think they, they used to call it in, in the one ads. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're t definitely happy to talk to people who really want our advice are going to follow through on it. So I want to go back to the example of these, you know, multi-biomarker panels for tumors. I actually think it's, it's pretty readily apparent, the outcomes that are of interest, not only to payers, but I think these are pretty important to patients, to physicians, and so on. You want to know whether uh, this information improves the result of treatment. You want to know that beyond the, the markers of tumor response or progression-free survival or disease-free survival. You really want to know whether there's longer survival or uh, avoidance of toxicity, avoidance of uh, drugs that won't work. I think all of those things can be readily defined. I think the real challenge in the situation we're describing, given the complexity, is, <coughs> okay, then what methodologic design, one that will be adaptive because you cannot be too static in this situation, will actually give you reliable evidence on those outcomes. That's where I think the, the real challenge is. I think the outcomes are not so hard, really. Just as a, a current example of, of some of the interaction with FDA and CMS and trial design is NIDDK recently brought uh, a group of researchers over to CMS, they had been working to design a trial for uh, artificial kidney. Um, set with the CMS coverage folks and said, CMS coverage folks said, well, you need to do X, you need to do Y, here's some other outcomes we think are important, here's a patient population you need to be uh, uh, particularly interested in. Uh, and then we think that would be information we'd be interested in. So that's the kind of interaction you can get it's actually two agencies at the same table. But, but that's, that's an example of like a single specific trial. I, I guess the question more broadly might be is, is, is there a, a metal level? Is there a higher level where, I mean, is the only value to those discussions to be on a trial by trial or study by study basis? Or are there some higher level guiding principles that it would be worth having some discussion about? I think it would have to be subdivided into groups that are so similar that the trials would be very similar. So a group of screening tests for pediatrics. I, I, I don't know what those groups are. You're smarter than I am for that. But there had to be some, some kind of, of uh, 
segregation of the test into sufficiently similar groups that uh, the, the study design would be pretty similar. All right, I, maybe, so clearly there's an area of, of evidence generation that's important that everyone's agreed is, is a key element. I, I think we still need to think about refining a little bit how we best engage the people sitting around the table to maximize the value of evidence generation for genomic medicine. In our sort of last few minutes, can we switch to the um, areas of privacy data sharing, incidental findings, and then those obviously relate to policy issues um, because the, you know, the common understanding about privacy and data sharing and incidental findings uh, ought to inform policy discussions that are, are held. So maybe we can spend a little bit of time talking about the, uh, the whole issue of, of privacy, incidental findings. We heard that raised a few times as sort of a scary barrier. You know, one of the reasons we might not want to do, uh, let's say, go to the extreme and do whole genome sequencing is we'll find other stuff. And when we find that other stuff, what are we obligated to do with it? I think many of us are nervous about a world in which we're so worried about not knowing what to do with stuff that we're not doing stuff. Um, that doesn't seem like a very good place to be. But how much of a barrier is this whole idea of um, incidental findings, and are there ways that the people sitting around the table should be working together to think about it? Bruce. So I think we need to be very careful in our vocabulary about incidental findings and think that there's a, a big difference between, let's call them unexpected findings that are clinically useful and are well demonstrated to be clinically useful, clinically useful, which is a fairly small subset, but an important one, versus unexpected findings that are clinically valid but not necessarily clinically useful versus unexpected findings that are variants of unknown significance. And I think when we subsume all of these, which I think we often do, into a single category of incidental findings, it creates a lot of confusion because, in my mind at least, the issue of what you do with variants of unknown significance is a very different question from the issue of what you do with clinically useful unexpected findings. So I think we just need to be very cautious about the vocabulary that we use here. I take your point, uh, but, you know, one of the concerns that I keep hearing uh, voiced is variants of unknown significance at some point in the future may be better understood. And are we creating, you know, liability problems? Are there other kinds of problems that arise from even uncovering those? So I have a question on incidental findings and in the case at least of next-gen sequencing is who are people, I mean, what are you doing in order to generate <laughs> incidental findings? Is next-gen sequencing or, you know, is whole genome sequencing being done widely and you're looking at it and saying, oh my gosh, you have cystic fibrosis? Or are you testing for a reason and you're testing a particular gene and you're finding, you know, a mutation you weren't expecting? I mean, what are we talking about here? And we're, again, we're sort of preempting tomorrow's discussion, but maybe a, a few words on that. Um, so the notion is, is that the testing is indicated for the college fields, if I'm to correct me if I'm saying wrong, that it's reasonable to use exome or genome sequencing to diagnose an undiagnosed disease that's likely to be genetic when other straightforward gene-specific modalities have failed. So it's generally done for that indication. So you have an indication for the test. You have a certain subset of the genome you're looking at to explain that phenotype. And then what do you do if things outside of that set of results arise? And so what the recommendations say is that you should look for selected variants in a selected set of genes, irrespective of the indication of the test because those findings are in that first category of what Bruce Korf just listed, things which it's reasonable for a practitioner to change the management of a patient or family if they find such a variant. But you would only be doing this testing in somebody that you couldn't diagnose otherwise. It is, and it, my understanding is, is that 
the feeling, I think the college's official policy is that it's not appropriate to order sh uh, whole screening. genome screening or exome sequencing on healthy people just as uh, to see what you can see. As a clinical test. As a clinical test, excellent. Right. I just think as we have the discussion about incidental findings, uh, to be clear, are we talking for clinical testing and not for research? Because I just think oh. the two, I know, but I just think yeah. we need to be absolutely clear on that. Yes. Thank you. Was there somebody over here that? So um, maybe just to f stir the pot a little bit, um, Muin, I think you were raising the possibility that maybe the time has come that we should be thinking about whole genome sequencing in a different way. Um, it, it, okay, so we'll blame Jim since he's not here. Um, but um, because if you think about it, there may be, I think you used the number, half a percent of individuals may have an undiagnosed Mendelian disorder. Um, if I can remember my numbers actionable, we, we heard from uh, Dan that something like 2% uh, <clears throat> for two. But there were also, it, for people that um, were being treated with warfarin as an anticoagulant, there is some percentage, I think you used the number 2 percent there as well, where um, people would benefit from knowing what their genotype was. And I think we can think about probably, if we all went around the room, another 5 or 10 or 15 examples of where that knowledge would be useful. And so now we're compounding. We're compounding a half percent, and we're compounding another per, a few percent, and we're also generating evidence uh, by linking it to outcomes. Um, you know, is that something we should be thinking about, or is that something we should be shying away from? Well, thinking about, sure. I guess I take the perspective, though, that the cost effectiveness of doing what Jim was suggesting and looking for, you know, screening everybody for the very small proportion that will turn out to have actionable things is a very different question from the one that Les will talk about tomorrow, which is when you've done it for some other reason and stumbled across something. I mean, I think we're a long way, I would guess, from having evidence that this is a cost-effective way to practice medicine to screen everybody for an exceedingly rare thing. So, uh, so one way to think about this is, is, you know, again, levels of how we might want to approach this. I think you could make a very compelling case at this point to say, um, of all the people that are having genomes sequenced, um, whether it's in a clinical setting or a research setting, and, and Les <laughs> has done some of this preliminary work with some genomes that he had available, what is the magnitude of the actionability problem? I mean define your list, whether it's the ACMG list, whether it's uh, the University of Washington list, uh, whether it's just pharmacogenomic variants, whatever. You know, every one of those genomes that's being done, it would be a useful um, research question to say, what is the magnitude of this problem that we're really talking about, and use real data to quantify it. And then we don't have to argue about the, the potentials. We could really say, look, here's what we found in a thousand genomes. And, and as I said, you know, Les will probably present some of the work that he's done tomorrow uh, just to, to try and get a sense of that. But that would be something where if everybody pooled in, we'd learn much faster. And we don't have to necessarily decide what to do with that because that's going to be the purview of the researchers or the clinicians that are actually dealing with it. But we would at least have the aggregated data uh, to be, be able to understand what we're, what we're dealing with. So, <clears throat> Oh. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think we're actually much closer to the clinical utility threshold of, of uh, whole genome sequencing. Uh, now, the data are different for a variety of reasons, but in a setting like the VA where we basically are going to capture somebody for life, it doesn't take very many pharmacogenomic screens to equal the cost of, of a whole genome sequence. And, and this isn't really looking at, at, at you know, it, it, and if, if you're looking at the Athena panel, one of the most, more expensive panels of genetic tests, a whole genome sequence is already well less. Now, now for the 
diseases caused by repeat expansions, you, need, you can deal with coverage, there, there's differences in the data. But I'm going to assume that over the next few years, we will see the point where it, it actually crosses. And, and especially when you're looking at the trajectory of, of caring for somebody for life, if they have uh, already a little renal failure, uh, a couple of chronic conditions, sequence them, you know, and, and, and then say, and, and then the final thing is, we're all talking about the Mendelian uh, actionable items. There's also, you know, you're going to find eight or 20 um, uh, recessive carrier conditions uh, that might affect the way that, that patient and that patient's family, especially if they're young. Uh, and and uh, you, it's not actionable if you have a CFTR mutation as a heterozygote, uh, but it might be for that person down the road or for that person's family. I, I think we're a long way from implementing whole genome sequence <clears throat> in the general population, but the time is right for asking the question on when do we go about doing this and <clears throat> what kind of research needs to happen before we do that. So having read Jim's, uh, Jim Evans' paper, Jim sort of, you know, pushed me into action here because he was thinking along the genome, not from the traditional pharmacogenomic traits or the the carrier testing or um, prenatal diagnosis or all the SNPs that we could use, you know, for stratified screening, but purely as a public health effort. And he said, we screen newborns. That's rare. I mean, if you, if you want to make a case today for a newborn screening program de novo, <clears throat> you probably cannot make it because we find 10,000 babies in 4 million births every year, okay? If you do, if you apply those same principles to a whole bunch of conditions. I mean, we have two million people with one of three conditions, BRCA, Lynch, and familial hypercholesterolemia. I'm not saying that, uh, I mean, we need to screen the whole population. I, I think to think about what you can do at the population level driven by the rare would open up, if you study it well, if it's cost effective, if it's, you know, the testing is right, the counseling, the, you know, all of these issues, the LC issues can be worked out then having made the first cut that, hey, we can screen the population, we can find people who need services and it's cost effective, now let's talk about what we do with pharmacogenomic traits because there the associations are weaker. They're not, you know, high lifetime penetrance. I mean, you're dealing with odds ratios from one and a half to three to four, and those will, I mean, if you don't, if you don't have the test, you would probably wouldn't make the case that you should have the test, but if you have the information, like what CPIC is doing now with the pharmacogenomic uh, network, you have that information. Why not develop uh, a guideline around dosing? And then you can test it out in practice whether or not it works, whether or not the benefits uh, outweigh the harm. So the, your entry into the genome has to be from two vantage points, the rare, testing people with rare Men Mendelian mysterious diseases that could have genetic component, but that will affect a very small segment of the population or to do a population screen on everyone to find the people who are rare. And I can guarantee you there are many more than uh, what's in the newborn screening panel. Now, can we make the public health case? It, it probably requires a decade worth of research, if not more, while the technology will improve and the prices will plummet, and then we figure out how to deal with the LC stuff along the way. So it's a research agenda that will probably ex, uh, span the next decade. Yeah, I was just going to respond to Mark's question about what's the magnitude of findings, of incidental findings. And just a, a brief survey I did with the ICGC, the International Cancer Genome Consortium, about 100 research investigators responded to my questionnaire about incidental findings and return of results. And, and it, it, it's there. About 50 percent of the respondents said that they did find um, something using a variety of methods. Obviously, not everyone was doing next genome sequencing that w were clinically relevant that they felt were was clinical enough to return to the patient and or their their physician. So 50 percent of all of them said they have already found something like that. And about 20 percent of them, and this is internationally, said that, yes, something has already been returned. So I, I don't think it's a matter of are we finding them. I mean, we're finding them. And we're finding them more and more as we do sequencing. So um, 
it, it's there. It, it's just a matter of what do you do with it, and those policies are so variable across the international community and certainly within the United States, and if anything, the perspective of the researchers in the United States was at the time, about a year ago, it's really not my responsibility to worry about it. I think that has changed in the international community. There was much more of a sense of it is my responsibility to worry about what I find regardless of what my original intent was. So I, I'm not sure we really need to, to look more at what's the magnitude people are finding incidental in, in clinically relevant clinical tests that are available in a CLIA approved lab findings now. Yeah, and, and I, I do want to make sure we're staying focused. The, the discussion here was not about the sort of the broader question of, and I, I think I misled us, I apologize, not the broader discussion about should we be doing whole genome sequences, but how much of a barrier is the whole privacy data sharing incidental findings piece to that? Because the incidental findings are going to be there, I think yeah, is what and, you're saying. Yeah, and that was part of a question that I asked in that survey, and it, it, <laughs> it raised the I'm concerned, but that's not going to limit me from trying to do this. Now, these were all researchers in large, you know, academic settings throughout the, throughout the U.S., so how that will get translated into implementing genomic medicine across the board in terms of are clinicians going to be concerned about, I don't know what to do with this other information that I'm going to get from it, and how do I interact with my genetics department or my medical geneticist, and what am I going to use, um, you know, to help counsel me, and is this a whole other consultation service that I need, I, I think is still a question, but I don't think the researchers, at least that answered the survey, we're not going to do next-gen sequencing because of their concern of, oh, now I have a whole other headache to deal with. So I'm influenced by the patients, too. What do, what do the patients think? And so in the clinical sequencing projects that, that we have, including Jim Evans, um, we now have some beginning to generate some data on this. And so these are mostly whole exome sequencing projects, and patients are given choices. They can opt out for the return of medically actionable variants, and they can opt out of non-medically actionable variants. And only a small percentage of patients opt out of the, they want to know about medically actionable variants. Only a few opt out from return of medically actionable. But similarly, that same small proportion, there's a small proportion that opts out, um, wait, I have this right, that, that, that most people don't care about the non-actionable variants. Right? I mean, you, you have similar results, I think. And so, I mean, you know, if, if there's an action, people want to know that, right? So I think we should all be happy that Naomi Aronson isn't here anymore, because if I were her, I would be terrified at this discussion. Uh, so the proposition is that people are going to have whole exome or whole genome sequencing done, and then they're, the, either a big brother will tell them you have nothing to worry about, or they will ask for their sequence data, and there will be a proportion of people who will say, oh, look, I have a mutation in desmoplakin 2, uh, a, a, a disease gene for arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, and I want an MRI. I don't care what you guys tell me. The only way to know that I don't have that disease is get an MRI. And you do that a couple of dozen times, and suddenly the the cost calculus changes around completely. And I don't see it. This is like a genie you're going to try to keep in the bottle. So I don't, I don't see, I understand that most of the variants that are on the ACMG list are, are variants of certain significance, but there's a ton of variants of uncertain significance, and I don't know how we're going to handle those, because I think there'll be, there'll be entitled uh, consumers who will say, I don't, you know, I don't care what you say, this is what I want to have done. Now, that might be 5 percent of the population, but it's still going to be a problem. So there's, you know, it comes back to sort of education. <coughs> That's a long-term solution. If we should move to that, CMS supports Naomi paying for that before they become Medicare beneficiaries. <laughs> 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 so, so, and, and, and I'm going to lose you. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for this, but, but um, I think we have to just keep going on that scenario because it's a real possibility. Yeah, two responses. Uh, number one is I think that is the primary justification that led 
the ACMG working group to very severely constrain the list. It's exactly the worry and that over-interpretation and chasing a lot of ghosts here would be unwise on a clinical basis based on what we know today. And that's exactly right. And that was a, an effort which is being criticized um, on all sides, which is <laughs> probably means it's about right, um, <laughs> to try and constrain that problem while still paying attention to some serious things that you can do something about. Yeah. And striking that balance is a very, very hard thing to do. And where the tipping point is, we will probably argue about forever. But I think there is one, and we, it, it's the right thing to do to do that. But the other thing I would add is, Rex, you framed incidental findings as a problem. And I actually don't think they're a problem. I think they're a research opportunity, and I think it gets back to what Mark said earlier, which is that the marginal cost of the data here is potentially zero. And so you can, if you were interested in understanding this issue in predictive medicine in a big way, you know, there are lots of people, and in spite of what anybody says about we can't start doing this until we prove it's useful, sorry folks, but thousands of exomes are going to be sequenced done this year for clinical purposes, and that's just the way it is. And we can sit in our ivory towers forever and, and scold people for doing that, but it's being done. And we'd be knuckleheads to throw the rest of those data away. And that is a way we can learn to do predictive medicine, and our data are essentially free, the raw data. And so why don't we grab them and do sort of a, you can think about, it's almost uh, analogous to post-marketing surveillance, is to do the post-marketing, hopefully, um, and, and grab these and study them because they're pretty un, unbiased ascertainment for these traits. And so this is exactly what we need. Is there a Oh, I was going to say, you know, that if, if you take this to the extreme, it's like the genomic version of whole body imaging. Um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with you, but we'll find something. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I, I think maybe people don't view it with the same skepticism, but perhaps they should. Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, that this point is very important and it's one that, that I think about a lot and, you know, in our whole genome sequencing research project, our intent is to uh, basically stay in contact with our patients and families at, on a minimum of an annual basis, uh, essentially uh, uh, in perpetuity to, so that we can do, uh, it disciplines us to do re-annotation. But ultimately, this is the research agenda that we're interested in doing, which is how do people use the information? What information do they want? What do they not want? how many of them are going out and doing a bunch of weird stuff that we wouldn't recommend. Um, you know, how big is the magnitude of that problem? Is it going to turn out to be like the, you know, the whole body CT scanning, which, you know, obviously the business model for that was not sustainable because anything that targets, you know, essentially a very small, I think Dan used the word entitled group of the population just as the uh, direct to consumer genome sequencing or genome, uh, whole genome, uh, SNP companies have found out it's just it's not there's not enough people that are really interested in finding out stuff at that level. But I think um, it, really defining the research agenda so that we can actually answer these questions as opposed to what we usually do, which is get a bunch of smart people in the room and argue about what we all believe. Um, you know, it really becomes a religious uh, debate as opposed to a, a discussion about how we could actually design research that could a answer some of the questions. Uh, and help to inform us how best to use this technology going forward. Yeah, I think if you phase it in and you learn how to manage incidental findings for exomes first, and then eventually we tackle whole genome, which would include mitochondria, promoter areas, you know, and those are research topics to really learn how to do that well. But it doesn't have to be done now, but eventually. Other people want to weigh in here? So um, it, I, I think it does sound like a research opportunity, um, but maybe it's not quite yet a genomic medicine implementation opportunity. It's an evidence gathering opportunity. I would, I would say that there are implementation opportunities. If you turn it in, on its head, and, you know, assume, again, you have all the information. Um, 
could you define clinical contexts uh, for a patient whereby you would go back and query the data? So could you build, so again, um, let's assume that we did, um, I, we had actually gotten funded for the newborn sequencing project. What we were planning to do was to create uh, clinical scenarios, so uh, the child that uh, f uh, fails their MCHAT for autism, or the child that shows global developmental delay, or a child that uh, presents with uh, later onset hearing loss. You can define a number of clinical scenarios that could occur within the first five years of life where you could go back and say, we need to assess these specific genes within the genome to look for the proximate causes of these things because we know they're likely to be genetic. Um, and that, I think, is, uh, you know, if you have that information, I think it is a huge wasted opportunity not to kind of think about how you could use this type of information over a lifetime. And we plan to beat the hell out of the genomes that we're collecting, you know, to answer these types of questions because ultimately, in my view, the only economic, economic argument that makes sense um, in terms of getting a, a whole genome is to be able to use it over the course of the patient's entire lifetime. And there's a whole... It's, it's not only the clinical scenarios, but it's how do you store it, how do you access it, how do you develop the informatics, and how do you do it at a sustainable clinical scale. I mean, those are the, those are the types of things that I find the most interesting in terms of how to answer, and ultimately, if we can figure out how to do that in a sustainable way, we'll provide the most value for what, whenever you get your genome, for whatever reason, how you can then use it going forward. As we're all eager to implement the whole genome, um, can I just caution us a little bit to approach <clears throat> the tool, whole genome sequencing, as a tool? It has to be evaluated. It's a T2 research agenda, not a T3 research agenda. In other words, at the end of it, we may decide it's not worth using it. <clears throat> the equipoise is not using the genome. Now, you're all here, we're all geneticists, and we're all excited about using the genome, but in many uh, clinical or population scenarios, if you are truly agnostic about the added value of the genome, forget the costs, but benefits versus harms, uh, <clears throat> we should be sort of prepared to the eventuality of possibly coming up with a negative answer. Are we ready for that? I just, I'm so confused by this. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I'm confused? No, I'm confused. Oh, you're confused by the by the skepticism of both the public health and the healthcare community that why should we do a whole genome sequencing on people? I'm not confused There's by that. I hear it every I, day. I see no, I think it's, it's delusional to think that it won't be useful in the future. That's nutty. I mean, we already know is that, that <coughs> it is useful for diagnosing rare right. diseases. Period. Is that, is that nutty or religion? I think if we believe... It's already useful. It's, I know, the point it's, was made that yeah, if, yeah. You're, if okay. your phenotype is caused by mutations in more than three genes, Fine. it's cheaper to do an exome than to do three single gene tests. So who is it that wants us to keep ordering single gene tests for these people in the long run? I, I'd like no, to no, know. I'm not, I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about people coming in for different healthcare encounters than 95 percent of people who don't fall in your bucket. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think we're talking about two different things. I mean, I, I, from my perspective, I agree with I think what you're saying, I mean, which is we shouldn't just be going out and randomly acquiring, you know, genomes. I think if you have a clinical indication that warrants doing a genome, and, and I think the, uh, based on the preliminary data that's come out of the application of this technology to children with complex undiagnosed diseases where we're including our yield, you know, improving our yield to, you know, causal uh, diagnoses, um, you know, uh, adding 25, 30 percent, um, then my point is if you do that, then, you know, you've got the genome. Don't just, you know, put it away and let it gather dust because uh, over the course of that patient's lifetime, um, I would argue, uh, given our, particularly in this country, our propensity to use drugs, that there'll be a hundred percent chance that we'll want a pharmacogenomic information to guide drug management at some point in the future. Um, so why would we want to exclude the use of that uh, at some point in the future? You know, now I think the answer that we are seeking is how often would we go back to it? How many uses would we have? And under what 
um, circumstances would you go back and use it? And there's a whole bunch of um, interesting questions related to the sustainability of those types of approaches. Uh, but I think that, you know, if you've collected a genome, it makes little sense to me to just use it for a single purpose and then just let it uh, molder. So I know this is a very heated discussion, but everything's focused on incidental findings. And, and maybe we need to separate that bullet into privacy and data sharing because I, and versus, and then in a separate bullet, incidental findings, because I think the privacy and data sharing issues are also huge and need to be addressed. Um, we need, I, I reckon genome sequences to like HIV results back in the 90s when they were hidden and you couldn't find them and you'd admit somebody the ED and not know that they're HIV positive because the, the <laughs> test results were so hidden and private. And um, I think if Mark wants to be uh, going back and looking at this over time, we need to balance the privacy issues with the clinical use issues around genomic uh, information that's done clinically. And I think a number of people brought up consent issues, that there are consents that are real short and ones that are real long, and that's just the form. We aren't even talking about the process. So I, I think having some discussion around these issues or ways to look at these issues also is very important. That was an area that I highlighted on my list of things, you know, that I uh, heard from the various presentations today that um, uh, the privacy, the data protection, that we're operating under a lot of different principles, a lot of different rules, a lot of different regulations. So I think even just sorting out, you know, what are the different rules that we're all operating under it in the different uh, federal entities, and is there a way short of some changes in legislation? Uh, but through uh, rulemaking, policy, uh, internal ability, that we can do some reconciliation around that. I think that would be something that could be a relatively early opportunity. So I think in light of the hour, um, <clears throat> maybe we can just return to where we started the day with what some possible outcomes might be, um, especially given the discussion over the last hour and a half now um, it, it does seem like there are certainly some common themes that resonate with most of the people sitting around the table. The, you know, the, the, the themes of standards IT infrastructure and uh, curated databases seem to be one. The idea of evidence generation seems to be another, and we've uh, actually, the whole discussion about Genome sequencing also is a sort of a part of the evidence uh, generation piece. And then uh, privacy, data sharing, and, and I'll take Deborah's suggestion of separating incidental findings maybe as a, as a separate uh, topic. So then given that <clears throat> sort of agreement around the table, um, wh where does that, does that leave us? Uh, do those commonalities in interest, for example, um, create a foundation for, uh, just to throw it out there, uh, working groups or task forces that uh, would engage the groups around the table here to continue to discuss those three areas. So maybe people can have an opinion about that and weigh in. <coughs> for the, uh, the, the last couple of discussions, the uh, f folks from the armed forces have been fairly quiet, um, maybe because it's sort of of less relevance, I don't know, but um, are those topics where continued engagement uh, makes, makes sense? The whole process is very interesting to me. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of very intelligent people make very valid um, assessments and suggestions in various aspects. I think the metaphor of touching the elephant in a couple of places is appropriate, and one would expect that because of the backgrounds that we've all brought to this table. And that contrasts with, you might say, some of the procedural ways that we work because of the idea that there's an immediacy sometimes to what we have to react to. And so while the 100% solution is the best, often, at least as an ideal situation, we often move out with the 80 percent. 
not to get back to Rumsfeld, you go to the war with the army you have. That's not my point at all. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> but but it, it's an interesting evolution of where you go with this. And so what I ask is, who has the authority to implement the change in order to know where to direct the energies of such a very elite group of experts? And that in terms of an immediacy, what are your challenges, which are financial, they're cultural, uh, both in terms of the community that you're directing this at, as well as those who are generating this, this level of appreciation of the entire problem. And with, the, with those as, and then what's the timeliness factor? So within ourselves, I sense a degree of urgency, but it's countered by some sense of how much do you need, by when, and how val what's the value of it in, in relation to other diagnostics that are currently the standard of care. So with those, as, as I see some of the operating uh, drivers, um, and a, a working group is very appealing to me as something that, barring an emergency, it takes and distills what's been discussed here into some, and keeping it simple and stupid, so to speak, where it is something that unifies the community and bring it back. Of course, in a way, I'm, I'm delaying what may be a desire here for a decision. But, but I sense enough expertise and, and subtle, sometimes, differences that the authority that needs to go forward with something that can be addressed to whomever the higher decision group is first needs to agree on, these, on the simple principles that, that can be then sold to that group. Um, you know, in ours, it's our Surgeon General. And I'm not sure in the other fields whom it may be directors and so on. But in that scalable way that it reaches up to the highest levels of decision-making authority, um, you make the first accomplished easy wins, relatively speaking, and then come back and revisit with the more complicated or technologically immature <laughs> aspects of this particular um, endeavor. I think a working group would be a perfectly reasonable uh, outcome. Uh, we wouldn't strive for much higher. Others want to wait. VA, do, do you, would any of these topics resonate with you enough that uh, you imagine um, there would be interest in participating in working groups? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I don't mean to do that, but just in a I, theoretical I, way. Well, no, I came here to be put on the spot in a theoretical way. The, 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 the VA research already has priorities that include genomics. I mean, so broadly speaking, absolutely yes. Uh, I'm on the clinical side, and we're, you know, I, I'm desperate for, for data, for, um, for standards so that we don't lose data. Um, I think, I think all, of, all of that is very good. Uh, I guess my take on all of this is that, you know, so our, our military colleagues have, have their um, regulations and, and limitations. They're, they're interested in, in uh, managing the people who are actively uh, enrolled, often deployed, and their dependents. In the VA, we can't touch dependents and, and uh, that and family members. And, and that often limits the practice of genetic and genomic medicine. Um, the, 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 you know, the, uh, our, our academic, you know, colleagues have, have different, different kinds of things. F unit, family units are covered, but then they leave the system. And so, and, and the, at, at the FDA, they don't regulate the tests. At CMS, they don't pay for them. The contractors do. And so we all have these little silos, and, and it's really hard to find uh, the big things. Now, I, I agree. We're all interested in these big pictures, and the question is, rather than uh, touching different parts of the elephant, can we all pick up our piece and maybe get it to move? But I'm willing. So one of, one of the things that we had talked about, and this may be way too um, uh, weird an idea to put forth this late in the day, but we, at least amongst the planning group, uh, thought about the idea of maybe creating a few use cases from our genomic implementation. And we've, you've heard some of them today, the Lynch syndrome, some of the pharmacogenomic things. And we could, you know, basically create a narrative that say, you know, imagine this clinical scenario. Uh, here is, uh, you know, how, um, you know, patient presents colorectal cancer. We do tumor-based screening, blah, blah, blah. Um, if we were to create a few of those use cases and send them around to the different constituencies represented here, 
and you were to say, here are the pieces that we touch, here are the pieces that we don't touch, here are the issues that we would see that would attend to our being able to deliver this use case as presented, um, that in some ways would allow us to uh, collect information around some of the things that we do think are ready for prime time and could be useful in terms of uh, identifying those areas where there may be either differences of opinion or gaps uh, that could be uh, used to organize what the work group might choose to focus on. So I just put that out there as a, as a possibility and whether that would be something that would, people would be of interest in terms of responding to it re would require some work on your parts. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I mean, Larry just articulated what the problem is. Everybody's got different purposes in existing, and you want to bring them all together and have them align, but they can't because, as the Admiral just said, um, everybody's got a different boss, and the bosses aren't agreeing, and they down at their level can't make decisions. So, I mean, we kind of know what the problems are, and so we're going to create use cases to do what exactly? So, so the assumption that I heard in your comment was that we can't agree on anything. And my argument yeah. would be is that there are some things we can, in fact, agree are important to solve. I would argue that we all want standards, and we're all going to have to deal with standards. You know, that's a no-brainer from my perspective. So why can't we talk about standards? Uh, and, and yeah, there may be some implementation aspects that come up at some point, but who's not, a, who's not for that? Uh, and, and even if we can get, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, in, in being good enough and not being, you know, uh, uh, paralyzed by the perfect. Um, if we can get 85% of the way, if we can get everybody on board, but the Air Force, I'll just pick on uh, on my friend here. I was going to defend um, you, Mark. If we can get if we can get everybody on board, but you know, but one group, then haven't we made some progress? And and doesn't that, in fact, then resonate up the chain of command? And you know, for whatever organization we're in, I guess that's the point. Is that we we tend to say it's hard, and it is hard, and yes, we've all met and we throw up our hands and we say it's hard, but. We never get to the point of, of just sort of taking it from the bottom and say, what can we agree on? What, what could we be useful? And I would still argue that if all of the groups around the table went to Ankh and said, we need standards for this and this is why, that we would be much more likely to make progress than my trying to go through somebody on the advisory committee to get it to happen. So I agree with Mark, and, I, and I'll, I'll say um, two reasons why. One, um, I think. You know, I, I wonder, underwent a change of leadership um, in the Air Force in terms of um, the certain general who had a grand vision for implementing genomic medicine, um, and then the subsequent surgeon general who has a, a much more um, operational focus. So I had to really change um, kind of the emphasis um, of our program, and I think that by taking it from the abstract of how do we implement genomic medicine to practical use cases where we can get those uh, the low-hanging fruit and the easy wins, I think that's a much easier way to show where the gaps are and how we can work together. And the second reason I think that's a good idea um, is the thing I'm asked most often in leadership meetings is, okay, well, who's leading, who's following, and who's watching? Um, even if we don't all agree that it's time to move out, um, people who don't think it's time can respectfully watch or follow when they think the time is right, and the people who think that it's time to go ahead and implement use cases can then lead the way and um, will learn by doing. So, so could I just defend myself, Mark? Which is that I think that, that if you take the healthcare delivery groups in the room of the agencies, I think you might be able to move a lot of things forward. But I think if you put the payers and the FDA and, and CDC potentially, not one, but you know, and but but you know, if you start mixing it up, then I think that you are going to run into major problems. But I think if you do stick to the groups that are trying to deliver the care for different populations, um, then that could be highly successful, and and that I I agree with. I just wanted to bring up one point that I've been noticing in, in the, this meeting as well as in several other meetings, and that is it seems that we always have a tremendously laudable goal, and they're appropriate, and we do need to strive for 
long stretch goals to really get to where we want to go. Not a problem with that. But because this is relatively unattainable, if we actually go ahead and mesh things together, why don't we really look at things where we can actually truly work together? Like, one point that was brought up on one of the uh, lists <clears throat> up there, there's really, there's quality and there's a standard, but there's no quality of data. And I'm hearing in this conversation, GWAS, SNP data, whole genome, exome, which one are we talking about? For clinical use? For research use, what are we doing with the phenotypes? Emerge is doing a great job with what they're doing, but has it been tested? Who tested it? Are we going to test it more? Are we going to build that? And you've got all these possibilities that we truly together could harmonize and get what is a core baseline. And from that, at least we got a foundation to go to those stretch goals that we're, to, uh, we're trying to get to. But at least we're working on this level plane of, this is the genomic data that we have, this is what it's coded as, <clears throat> everybody understands what that means because everybody interrelates that data. Because even currently, I mean, you go back 10 years, take a look at how the annotations for some of the sequences may be, they may be very different than what we are saying right now too. And they probably will be with human genome version of 25 when we go in the future. So I think that's just a suggestion. Maybe, the, maybe I'm trying to bring us down too far, but I think it's something that we could all work on and at least agree. And then we at least have the feeling that, yeah, we did achieve something. We agreed on this one or two or three things. <clears throat> Resonate with Ron a little bit. Can you show us maybe one of the initial slides, like what we're trying to do here? No, just go back, like the purpose. Who is out? No, I mean, different deck. okay, different deck. Because I'm, you know, I like lofty goals. I've <clears throat> tried to uh, do a few myself. Uh, at the end of the day, you you cannot herd the federal agencies together. <clears throat> not from NIH, not from NHGRI. That's a higher level function, and that's why before there was the uh, the secretary's advisory committee, which was a secret, you know, an HHS level. Herding. They could herd FDA, they could herd CMS. Of course, they don't, they don't deal with the VA. It didn't work. But the times have changed, and I think the time. Well, you're right, you're right. I mean, I'm not. Well, it takes, it takes two years to create a new advisory committee. So, I mean. So, that may not be the answer. But, I, I mean, I want to ask my NHGRI colleagues uh, what are you trying to achieve at the end of the day? And maybe there is a simple answer to a simple question, where would you like to be a year from now or two years from now, given all these past histories of missteps and, and so on and so forth, where, where are you trying to be, given the research focus of an HDRI? Well, that's a big question I might ask Eric to, to comment as well. I, I think what, what we're trying to do in this forum is to get multiple federal agencies at least moving in the same direction toward genomic medicine implement, implementation and not arguing about what evidence we need or we don't deal with that or that's not our purview or this, that, or the other thing. What are the things that we can agree upon and, and work on together? And it seems to me we've all heard we need evidence. We need evidence. We need evidence, evidence, evidence. So everybody agrees on that. And we have in the room people who are responsible for the health care of untold millions of people. I mean, you know, I mean, there are large numbers of folks that are represented by the groups here. What better place to generate that evidence? And in doing so, we can address things like standards and IT infrastructure, not all of the issues but a couple, um, and privacy and data sharing, obviously those issues are going to come up. Incidental findings are another issue that's going to come up. And so, so those are all things that we can touch on. We can't solve them all, but at least we can get started on them. And it, and it seems to me that if we were to come up with an approach for generating evidence within those healthcare systems, and it's great for me to say that because although I am marginally part of one of them, I, I'm not heavily involved in, in any of them. Um, but if that were something that we could agree upon to do, I think it would be a major step forward. And a year from now, I'd be thrilled. So why complicate? Oh, okay. To, to countermand what yeah, I actually, I, the, no. I'm actually going to agree with everything you said. I'm, maybe I would, I would, I would come at it with a slightly di different way to add and augment what Terry said. Let me be very clear. NHGRI is not doing this because of some patriotic cause or because we feel we have the duty of the federal government to lead this effort. 
In fact, we didn't lead with the federal agencies. We led with our colleagues. We, it's a bit of a Pied Piper thing. We got together people who were actually doing genomic medicine starting a couple years ago at, at genomic medicine meeting one and two and so forth. And along the way, we keep hearing, you should talk to these people, you should talk to these people. We have, in the fall, we're going to talk to international groups. It would be ironic if we actually were successful at engaging international groups doing genomic medicine and failed to do it at the federal government when we're part of the federal government. So we will try. But if indeed you're correct, that we'll get nowhere because we're just some little ditzy institute in the NIH where and it should be done at the department level or it should be done at some higher level, then that's fine. Then we'll fail and that's okay, but at least we will have tried by convening people to see if you're interested in coming along, you have, we have no authority to make you come along. We're just, we're just convening here. We're not trying to do anything more than that and we're not doing it uniquely to other federal agencies. We're doing this across the board to other researchers, other organizations and other countries. So, Eric, I don't want you to fail because <clears throat> we, I mean, there, there is no need to fail at this point. Uh, you're probably right in terms of moving the international community <clears throat> easier than moving the U.S. community. But uh, given the research focus of NHGRI and the, the desire to move into evaluation and implementation research, I mean, that's a laudable goal. You can drag the rest of the NIH institutes along, along with you. And you probably don't need much of the FDA or CMS or CLIA, I mean, if you focus on the research agenda that says, okay, this is what we, the research community, think we need. We've heard all the stakeholders, we've heard the, the problems of coverage and reimbursement and oversight and, and all of these things. You know, we're going to construct a, a research agenda for the next decade that essentially, at the end of it, will, show, will make a very strong case for implementation of genomic medicine. And that's, I think, what you're trying to do. You're trying to move into that T2, T3, and T4 space, which up to this point, you've done only the T0 and maybe a little bit of T1. And that, I think we can all subscribe to that. There is nothing wrong with that. It's just trying to herd all the federal agency along with you to say, <coughs> okay, at the end of that research, oh, would you cover us with the, the CMS? I mean, forget them. And I'm sorry if I say that, but I mean, they're all my friends and colleagues, sure. but you know, focus before, on the yeah. research agenda. Well, before we offend anyone, it is late in the, in the day. I mean, I, I, yeah, that's right, that's right. I mean, I, I think what, what we're saying is we're, as, as Eric said, we're convening, we're the Pied Piper. We'd, we'd love to have people participate with us. We think there are things we can do even if others don't participate. And so, so you know, it's sort of an open invitation. Well, and I think it's, it, it's interesting, so having you know, like several people in the room sat through all of the genomic medicine meetings to date, um, I think we would have been remiss if we didn't have CMS and um, all of the stakeholders that are in the room today together to have this conversation. That doesn't mean that everybody needs to sign up for the long haul, but I mean, I, you know, I, I think there are probably lots of opportunities for collaborations across these groups that make the end result of the efforts that we put into it stronger than if we didn't have those folks sitting around the table. And, and so I think th that's an important message. It's not to make anybody do anything. No, nobody in this room has the ability to do that. But it's about creating an opportunity. And so we want to make sure that everybody that feels that they have something to bring to the table has an opportunity to do that. So uh, I had some remarks at the beginning, and I've enjoyed myself all day long. Just a few observations, and that is that all of the organizations that are represented here today are, are stakeholders, and they have stakeholders who support them and for whom and from whom they are influenced. But I think all of us and what we have to do in our missions are much more similar or alike than we are dissimilar. Unfortunately, the human nature is to focus on the reasons why not as opposed to the reasons why, and we can very easily fall into those gaps. So, of course, number one might be that we try to put forward our own interest and initiatives and not try to second-guess guess what the others who are here might be hearing or might be agreeing with or might not be agreeing with, but I think it is an absolute 
necessity for all of us from our different organizations and stakeholders to come together, support to come together. However, I see what we're doing as, if I hearken back to my high school and college days, we, we're involved in a complex equation. We're trying to solve a complex equation. And as the Admiral will tell you from time to time, he looks at me out the corner of his eye sometimes when I'm giving him a briefing, I ask him to take a margin note. And of course, that, what that means is I'm focusing on what he's asked me to provide for him, but there is something on the edge that we will need to come back to at a later time. And I think if we look at it that way, as opposed to putting those margin notes directly in the outline, we can go move forward and have an opportunity to make progress, keeping in mind that to solve the equation, we're going to have to deal with the margin notes as well at some point. To emphasize what the Admiral had to say about the 80 percent, um, and this is a gross um, example. But from our perspective, if we are dealing with operational commanders who are looking for the ability to recruit a certain quantity of individuals to go into the field to fight a mission, the last thing those people want to hear up front, unless we have a solution for them, is why they can't just recruit these people, take them out in the field, and determine how many of them aren't going to function in, on the basis of how they function as opposed to presupposing that there's a risk that they're not going to function, and therefore we screw up their ability to even reach their recruitment goals. Now, that's not to say that that's gross, because we should have the capability of providing for them the specific type of individual that they want. But unless we include that issue as, as a margin note as we move forward, we will screw them up because we'll come up with all sorts of reasons why, as they recruit 1,000 people, they can only get 80 out of the group that come forward because we have all of these contingencies and risks and whatever. So the complex equation is we move forward, we try to define what we can. We keep our margin notes, and before we solve the equation and turn it into the proctor, we are certain that we take care of those margin notes as well in the complex equation. For every action, we were taught there was an equal and opposite reaction, but I'll present to you that there also are tangential reactions that you have to pay attention to, and those are the ones that I think we're worried about. We can come back and deal with those. Thank you. So we are at the... Yep. So just to comment about a potential outcome, uh, I think if we had a paper in which all the perspectives were uh, captured as to why the EGAP recommendations on Lynch syndrome have not been achieved in their organization or from their perspective, it would be really powerful. Um, you know, that's almost five years old. Every, everybody agrees that they're good recommendations, they're evidence-based, and yet no organization is really uniformly applying them. And that in a sense lays out the research agenda and the needs that we have as a research community when we lay out why we're not doing that. So just an idea. It's a good example of a use case that we might, we might pursue. So we're at the end of the defined time that we had. I don't know, uh, Eric, do you want to add anything? Terry, you want to add anything? No, we should, we should mention breakout rooms for the for the groups that are planned to me. So we do have, have uh, some working groups that have been held over from uh, some of the previous meetings. The, the cancer group was uh, planning to meet. They'll, they have the Potomac Room, which is on this floor. I'm not sure exactly where, but it's nearby. Um, and the, uh, the periodontal group has the Severn Room. Um, we had suggested meeting at 545, but it's up to you as to, as to when you want to. Um, so, so feel free, and I'm sure they would welcome others to, to sit in and, and listen to what they're doing. So um, I, I think it's been a really terrific discussion today. We've had really wide-ranging discussion. Um, <coughs> the uh, genomic, <coughs> excuse me, the genomic medicine working group I think will have to go away and do a little bit of uh, thinking. <laughs> well, maybe that too. <laughs> thinking about um, you know how best to capitalize on the energy and the participation of everyone in the group. 
and um, we'll try to get back to you with some ideas, uh, either if not tomorrow, then soon, but maybe even tomorrow for some discussion in the recap. Any final comments anybody wants to make? Otherwise, we'll adjourn for today and we reconvene at 8 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs>